And now our most special speakers. Thank you so much. I'm just like so thrilled and it's just been waiting for this day for so long. So uh, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam, and uh, I don't want to like copy everything in there, but I do want to say he's the legendary Dr. Venkat, an award-winning author, one of the most celebrated sought after speaker of all times, founder of Agile Developer Inc., a whole list of accolades, right? That include Java champion, Java Java Rockstar, Jolt Productivity Award winning books, every, you name it, uh, Ben Cat has that <laughs> on him, on his resume. A very passionate and true polyglot programmer. That's so important. A true, true like craftsman. That's something I really am building my own craft. I go after the good crafting, <laughs> craftsmanship. And a highly sought after consultant by companies from all over the world, you know, among many things. So I, I cannot even finish all the whole list, but uh, Ben Cat, I'm sure you want to start your talk and everybody's eager. So. The stage is all yours, and thank you so much again, Van Kettis. Mary, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, the, the only complaint I have is that I have to see you through this window and not yeah. to be in person, but next time uh, I really miss being there. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is staying safe. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks to JFrog and Vincent. It's great to see him as well for uh, the sponsorship and IBM for all the efforts. And again, thank you for all the people behind uh, CJUG and all the wonderful things you do. Let me go ahead and share my screen so we can get started right there. So I'm going to talk about something that I've been really excited about. Well, you know that I'm a person who can get easily excited, but this is something that I'm super excited about. And I'm going to say this is probably one of those really, really good things happening in Java in a long time. There are several great things happening in Java. So if I say this is amazing, that actually pushes it even further down. So I want to talk a little bit about what is available. And I did take your short-term title, so I actually like it. So I decided to change the title to what you gave, so I love it. So I'm going to talk about asynchronous programming, and I want to talk about Project Loom. And I'm going to rant away for the next several minutes, and then eventually we'll start digging into code and take a look at some code examples of how this actually works. But before we go any further, just quickly to emphasize this, the code examples I'm going to be writing is going to use Project Loom, which obviously is not released yet. Now, one question people often ask is, when will it be released? That's a terrible question, by the way, because one of the things that annoys almost everybody is asking when, right? When I write books, I always like, please don't ask me when it will be done. So, so we always think about it. Well, Project Loom has been in development for a long time, maybe 10 years. And I'll tell you why it's taking this long, and you will really appreciate it. And once you hear it, you're going to say, take more time. That's what I tell them. It's OK, take the time, because this has got to be done correctly. So this is not something you can just do it lightly and come back and fix it later on. You have to really make sure that you have taken care of every single thing in the system. And I'll talk about some of those later on. So it will be released sooner than later, but I don't know exactly when maybe a year from now, maybe sooner, maybe a little longer, but I think it's very well worth the wait. Now let's talk about the problem before we talk about the solution. Now, it's a, often a confusion for a lot of developers, me included, it's what's parallel, what's concurrent. So I want to kind of set them apart a little bit so that we can be clear about it. So parallel is when multiple tasks can continue exactly at the same time or simultaneously. Concurrency is where, given a period of time, two or more tasks are progressing. But any given instance, only one of them is active. For example, I really wish I was on stage for this one, but I will use my little stage here to demonstrate this. So here I am in the corner of my little stage. I am walking and talking. Well, and I can walk and talk at the same time. That is parallel. So I am not pausing and then saying a few words, and then taking a few steps after that. So the walking and talking can happen simultaneously along the way. So in other words, walking and talking is parallel for what I do. However, as I am talking, I just took a sip of water, as you can see, and it'll be really impolite to drink water and talk in parallel. I don't even know how it's going to show up. It'll be garbled words, very impolite, uncivilized. I may even choke up doing it. So in other words, I talk and drink water concurrently, 
but I can talk and walk in parallel. So what does that really mean? Well, I'm not sitting here and drinking this entire glass of water and then starting my talk. Instead, as I'm saying a few words, I could take a sip and say a few more words. So that's basically concurrency. So concurrency is really where we can have uh, two tasks going on at the same time, but if only one of them is active at any given time, that's basically what's happening in this particular case. So having said that, so what, what is the difference between parallel and asynchronous is well? Uh, we probably have to uh, mute a few people who are uh, having a microphone active along the way. So if you can uh, find and mute, that'd be great, Mary. Thank you. So, uh, so in terms of the parallel and asynchronous activity, asynchronous is opposed to synchronous where we are really talking about non-blocking call, if you will. And uh, asynchronous call may be, you know, sequential or it could be parallel as well. It doesn't have to be. And that is one of the nice tricks about asynchrony. So asynchrony doesn't always mean parallel. It might be parallel. It might not be parallel. But in a sense, a particular thread might really be able to switch between multiple tasks asynchronously and do the work. And that's where the power really comes in. Let's dig into this a little bit further to see what that really means. When it comes to threading, we all know that threads are considered to be lightweight. But as it turns out, the word lightweight is very relative. What may be lightweight in one context may really be heavyweight in another. And also, threads are lightweight compared to processes, but doesn't mean they are absolutely lightweight. So the context really matters in this particular case. And so we have to be a bit careful about how we actually see that. So having said that, the question I want to ask here is, how many threads can we create? More important, I would say, how many threads should we create? Oh, by the way, before we continue on, best time to ask questions is any time you have a question or a comment. So please don't hesitate to ask questions anytime. And anytime you have a question or a comment, please do post them on the chat uh, and, and, and don't hesitate at all. And if that's something we can address right away, we'll answer that right away. Otherwise, we can take it up in the end as well. But anytime is a great time for questions or comments. Um, so let's talk about how many threads can we create? That's really a bad question in a way. That's like asking, how many pizzas can I have? That's a very unhealthy question. The more important question is, how many threads should I create? Well, as it turns out, the should answer is different from the can answer. The should answer, it actually depends on the number of cores you have in your system. And if you create more threads than the number of cores, and if your job is competition intensive, that could really be a problem. But for this presentation, I want to focus on the can. How many threads can you end up creating, assuming there are no other roadblocks? Well, as it turns out, the answer is limited by the amount of memory. And that could be a little surprising, if you will, when it comes to figuring this out. So let's give it a try. How about that? So let's say for a minute, I want to define an int max is equal to, oh, let's start with a little puny number of 100 to begin with. So what I want to do in here is to start by saying, I want to create a thread after all and work with it. So I'm going to say a thread, let's say in this case, a thread is equal to, oh, let's simply set it to a null for a minute. Let's go through of integer i equal to zero. And let's say i is less than, oh, let's say max i plus plus. And what I want to do here is to create a thread of execution. So thread is equal to new thread. And what do I want to do within this thread? Oh, let me say sample and maybe call a function called a nap function, something I could actually use from time to time. I'm going to call the nap function. Then I'm going to say thread.start and execute that code. When we are done with it, um, uh, after starting that is, I'm going to simply output right here. We'll say started and we will report the number of threads we created max, let's say, and we will say threads. And that's basically what I'm going to say here is that we created that many threads right there. Awesome. Then I say thread.join and just wait for the last one to complete. And then I'll simply say in here, the fact that we are done with this, I'll simply say done and print it. 
Now that of course brings us to the point, what in the world is the nap function? Now the nap function is going to be a really simple function. So I'm going to simply say public static void nap. And all I'm going to do within this function is let's put a try block, a thread dot sleep for oh, let's say about five seconds time. And then I'm going to simply wrap that into a catch exception as we traditionally do and simply go ahead and write the code like so. So with that said, what you can see in here is that we simply have a little code that's going to execute and provide a little sleep. Now the question really is, it's a really funny function to think about. What happens when you call sleep in Java? Well, when you call sleep, what's happening is that thread is going to pause for that many seconds. But the question you want to ask is, what does the thread do when it passes on that sleep, right? Well, in, it turns out, unfortunately, the thread is going to be held hostage while it sleeps at this point. And if you are thinking, my goodness, is that a waste of resource? Exactly, right? So it's an active sleep. It's going to hold the thread and wait for it at that particular time. Well, let's actually see that here in execution. So if I go back to this code, oh, interrupted exception, it says, of course. So it simply say throws, let's go ahead and say uh, exception. I don't care about the exception right now. So we'll just go ahead and call that one right there and ask it to just simply display that for our purpose. So you can see that it was able to create 100 threads, not a big deal. Now I'm going to say create 1,000 threads for me, please. Well, that shouldn't really be a problem, isn't it? So it created a thousand threads, not a problem. Five seconds later, it's done. What if I say create for me, oh, let's say 5,000 threads. Well, it depends on how much memory I have on this machine, isn't it? So I was able to create 5,000 threads, not a problem. What if I said create 10,000 threads right now. And I feel like I'm auctioning something here, unfortunately, right? So we keep increasing this number right now. Oops, that did not go well. So anywhere between 5,000 to 10,000, what happened? It says out of memory error, unable to create native. And it says possibly out of memory. It's not even sure what actually happened, right? So in this case, it's possibly out of memory and it failed. So what did we learn from this exercise? Well, what we learned from this exercise is that we are not able to create a lot of threads. And again, it depends on what you mean by lot. Well, in this case, maybe about 5,000 or more threads, I'm running into trouble. But what if I really want to have more threads to perform tasks in my system? How is that going to work? And the answer is, sorry, that will not work. And what do I do if I want more scale? If I want more scale, I better get a cloud environment and have a lot more servers running. And who does this make happy? All the cloud vendors, of course. They're like, keep going, right? So the point really is, this is not a situation where it's not friendly to the, the environment. It's not really cost effective either. And that's gonna be a problem in the long run. So the question is, what can we do about it? But let's revisit that thought in a few minutes, but I'm gonna take this code away and I'm gonna save this away for a little bit because I'm gonna come back and work on this code again. So let me take this code and say, you know, how many, that's what I'm gonna call it. And we'll come back and bring that code back up and take a look at it a little bit later. So I saved it as how many, that's what I called it. And we'll come back and pull that code again and play with it later on. So now that we have that code, out of the way, the next thing I want to ask a question is, how does multi-threading actually work? Well, we all have written sequential code. So what happens in a sequential code? You have one thread of execution, you call a function, it performs an action, returns a response, you go to the next function, and the next function and its function, and you're doing this sequentially. Now, if one of those functions take an extended period of time, what's going to happen? That becomes what's called a blocking call. And when you have a blocking call, the thread is going to hold you and you're going to wait for this to complete at this point. And when the thread is waiting, you say, gosh, the thread is waiting. I want better performance. I want more responsiveness. So what do you say? Well, if one thread is waiting to solve the problem, let's create more threads. And what would those more threads do? So they can block and wait also. 
That sounds a little counter logic, isn't it? Counterintuitive. Why would you want to create more threads, which in turn will block and wait? That doesn't seem to help after all you think. Let's take an example scenario uh, as to what we do. So in, in, in this case, in existing programming model, threads are usually tied to a task. But let's say you go to work in the morning. And what is the very, very first thing you do? Let's be absolutely honest about it. The first thing I would do is to go get a cup of coffee, right? I mean, how could you even you know, think about functioning without having a, a cup of coffee? So I go to the coffee machine and I find that the coffee machine is empty. And, and how, how cruel when that happens, right? So I turn on the coffee machine and it's brewing coffee. And if you are like Java multi-threading, you would just stand there and not move a muzzle. And everybody comes around and says, what happened to you? And you say, I won't talk to anybody until I get the coffee. Well, yeah, I know, I know there are some days we feel like that, but that's not the way we do. So what do you typically do? You are the same person. You get the coffee, it's available. If the coffee is not available, you turn on the coffee machine to brew and you come to your desk. Maybe you turn on that email and it's downloading a large file. Then what do you do? You go to a colleague and say, hey, are you ready to talk about the design you want to talk about? And your colleague says, I'll be with you in a few minutes. Then what do you do? You come back to your desk and you're reviewing a particular report you had to review. Now, if I ask you, what are you doing? The right answer is, I'm in the middle of getting coffee, middle of downloading that large email, waiting for my colleague to start the design meeting and reviewing the report. It is you in five different states at the same time. Well, okay, four off by one error. But the point really is that you are in the middle of multiple states. And that's the way you do things. But in the case of Java, what we have been doing, you go to get the cup of coffee, you say, gosh, I don't have a coffee, so I'll create another thread that can check the email. Oh, now I'll create another thread to ask my colleague. I'll create another thread to go read the report. And you're like, why do I need four threads when every thread is blocked and waiting? That's not a very efficient use of the resources after all, isn't it? So it's time for us to fundamentally rethink about our programming model. So in the past, what we did is we call, we attach task with the threads, if you will. So when a task is blocked, the thread is blocked with it. A good example of that is as simple as the sleep function you saw. So when you call a sleep, the thread literally is waiting on that call before it can move forward. So which means when a task is stuck, the thread is stuck. Now, this is kind of like going to a restaurant and you're sitting around in a restaurant, the waiter comes around and, and the waiter says, what would you like to have to drink? And you say, what are interesting things here to drink? And the waiter says a few things that are interesting. And you say, let me think about it, what I'm in a mood for. And while doing so, you're saying, waiter, stay here, don't leave. Well, that's not a very efficient use of the waiter's time, isn't it? So a good sensible waiter will say, while you think about it, let me come back right away and go serve other tables. So that's basically called efficiency, isn't it? So what if a task is going to take some time? We don't want to be creating more threads and blocking them. And that's basically what the problem really is. And so as a result, we want to really keep running other operations along the way, if you will. So this is where we want to rethink about what we do. But in order to do that, let's consider a slightly different example here to understand how things can end up blocking if we are not careful. So what I'm going to do in the next code example is I'm going to go ahead and write a function. So we'll say public static. Let's say in this case, I want to return from this one. Oh, let's say a string, we'll call it as read response. So the read response function is going to take a little ID so we can identify what thread is running what piece of code, if you will. So in this case, of course, I'm going to say that I want to go ahead and create a little piece of code where I want to go talk to a website and get some information. So let's put a little exception here for a second so that 
I don't have to propagate that from this code. And I would simply maybe, you know, a return maybe in this case, some error that I may have re received. So it's a return, let's say in this case, uh, ex dot get message. Great. But what do I want to do within this code? Well, I'm going to go ahead and say, this is Java dot net dot star. I'm going to make a network call at this point. So given this function to read, I'm going to first of all say making, let's say, request. And I'm going to say the request ID that's been given to us so we can distinguish one from the other as we make the request. So I'm going to say making request ID. And in this case, I'm going to say from. And let's output the thread of execution. So thread dot, let's say, current thread and display the thread that's calling this function. When we are done with this call, I want to say that I am done making the request as well. So we can say received, we'll say received. And what am I receiving? A response. And for that response, for that ID from the thread. So we can see what thread is receiving the request and what thread is you know, receiving the response and moving forward after that. But between these two calls, what I want to do is to say URL is equal to new URL. And the, uh, and the URL I want to pass to this is a URL that will simulate a delay for me. So HTTP, and this is called HTTP status, uh, stat dot US, and this takes a error code you want to be returned, and I'm going to say sleep is equal to five seconds. So when I make the call, that call is going to take five seconds to return back. Then I say string response is equal to and I'm going to create a new scanner, if you will. And to the scanner, I say URL dot open stream. And I will read the next line from the scanner. And I don't really care about the result I got back from it. And I will simply return the response at the very end of this. So that's basically the code I wrote in this function. I'm going to go read the response from the URL and return the response. But I'm going to say how much time I took to process this request, as you can see in here, by saying received response. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to say which thread is executing that after a five second delay, if you will. Oh, missing quote, I think we'll figure that out along the way. So as and as and when we get the error. So you can see how in this case, we are able to make the processing of that particular code in there. But of course, what I also want to do is to wait up on the execution of this code. So for that, I'm going to say private static. In this case, we'll simply say max equal to five. So I'm going to make five requests so we can examine that. And I'm going to bring in here as well. Oh, let's go ahead and call this as a countdown. Let's say countdown latch. And I'll say latch is equal to new countdown latch. And of course, that's going to be size of max over here. That, of course, as you know, comes from the java.util.concurrent, which is where this is existing, and we will use that. So what am I going to do in here? Well, when I'm done with this code, of course, I'll say finally, and what am I going to do in the finally block? Well, in the finally block, of course, I'm going to simply say the latch.countdown and simply say that I'm done. So any code that's blocking on it can continue. So that's a good start for the piece of code we are starting with. So that is the uh, get res re read response function, which is going to go to the web, get the response, causing a delay of execution in there so we can keep an eye on it. And as you suggested, right, the double quoted string. So we go to the HTTP. That's going to be the string, a uh, double quote right there. And the compiler is going to tell me if it's happy with it. So let's go ahead and fire that up and see how it is dealing with it. So that seems to be OK in the compiler. Great. The next step I want to do in here is of course, I'm going to make a call to this particular service and see if I can see the thread information. We'll simply say throws exception right now. I don't want to deal with exceptions at all at this point. But I'm going to simply say for, and let's go ahead and bring up the loop in here for us to use. So for int i equal to 0, and i is less than max that we have that many threads. But I'm going to simply work with the normal thread to begin with. So in this case, I'm going to simply say, here is an index is equal to the value i. And I'll simply say new thread. And the thread is going to execute this piece of code. So we'll simply go ahead and call the function response, uh, uh, read response, right? So read response. So we'll call the read response function and pass the index to it like so. So of course, once I do it, I'm going to simply call the start function on it. 
So we started a thread of execution to execute this piece of code. And I'm curious to know how long, uh, 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 how many threads it's going to run and what threads things are going to run. So at the end of the for loop, I'll simply say latch dot await and ask it to finish up all the execution. And I'll simply say at the very end of this, I'll simply say done. So a fairly simple code, right? But let's look at the code one more time. We create five different threads, ask each of the thread to re run the read response. The read response function tells me what thread is running and it makes the call. When the call comes back, tells us what thread is running and returns the response back to the caller, right? That's basically what this code is doing. Of course, I have five threads running the code. Let's take a look at this. Notice the calls have been made, the response have come back, but if you watch this closely, the request zero was executed by thread zero, coincidentally. One by one, two by two, three by three, four by four. So those are the execution before the calls. After the calls, zero was executed by zero, four by four, two by two. So what do we know? It's the same thread that was executing both the calls. So in other words, the thread is pretty much stuck here, waiting for the in IO to complete for it to resume and move on. That we know as synchronous execution. So in a sense, in this particular case, all we did was we blocked and waited. Now think about this for a minute. If my application has several requests coming in, and for every request, I've got to make a number of external calls. The threads are going to be held hostage waiting for the response from the call, which means the throughput is going to be less because I'm limited to number of calls I can make because limited by the number of threads I can have. I can be creating more and more threads and blocking them all. That's not an effective use of resource. This is like having a few waiters and the waiters are stuck at a table and, and such restaurant cannot scale for business. So a good restaurant is going to really train their waiters to say, hey, serve a table, but don't wait on a table. Imagine waiters don't wait on table, right? They will serve the table very quickly. And if something is going to take time, they'll say, I'll come back and they leave and serve other tables. So what we want to do is the following. Here is a task. Here is a thread. When a task is delayed, the thread shouldn't be delayed. You want to separate those two out. So when a task is blocked, you want a task to be blocked because you cannot do any work until you get a response from a task. But when a task is blocked, you want to detach the thread and have the thread serve other requests. And when the task is completed, you want to attach a thread to it and finish up the rest of the work. So in other words, you want to decouple your task from your thread and be able to reuse your thread for other purposes. So the question is, how can we do this very effectively for our work to be done is the question. So let's save this code away and we'll come back to this as well. So let's go ahead and say this is the code we just wrote. And of course, we'll say thread and a task and we'll save it away. We'll come back and take a look at this code later on and see how we can make this better for performance and better scale as well. All right, so going back to this code right now, let's go ahead and think about what does Java really provide in terms of Project Loom? Where does it come in? So let's take a break from this and revisit this concept in a few minutes. Let's talk about continuations. What in the world are continuations? A question or a comment. Assume my server has a 500 gigabytes of memory and, 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 and has uh, threading issues, increasing memory to uh, does that help? Not really, uh, uh, Masin, if your computations are, uh, if, your, if your code is computation intensive. So I'm gonna take a slight detour to answer your question, if you don't mind. So the question is, if my computer has 500 gigabytes of memory, and if I'm having memory issue, can I increase the memory to get a better result? So I want to say something you want to think about in terms of the number of threads. So number of threads is actually dependent on a couple of things and you got to be very careful deciding that. So if you think about the number of threads you can have, 
the number of threads you can have is e is less than or equal to the number of cores on a machine divided by what I like to call as one minus the blocking factor. So what is the blocking factor? Blocking factor uh, is the uh, 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 blocking factor is the uh, percentage uh, uh, or fraction of time a thread is blocked, let's say, on I.O. operations. So in other words, going back to your question, if your tasks are, let's say, computation intensive, uh, if they're computation intensive, then what do we know? We know that the blocking factor, this guy right here, right, blocking factor, we know that the blocking factor is zero because it's computation intensive. It's number crunching all the time. And number of threads is going to be, in this case, uh, less than or equal to number of cores. So notice, in addition to the memory that you have, you're going to be limited by the number of cores. Well, what does it mean when cores have hyperthreading? It actually doesn't mean a whole lot because you're still using an operating system level threads. So maybe you could push it to an hyperthreading numbers, right? But that's not a whole lot in general. It's not like you have a few cores and maybe hundreds and thousands of times more of hyperthreading, right? So it's really within, within the same range in general. So it's not really that significant of a number in general. So on the other hand, if your tasks are I.O. intensive, and if your blocking factor is 0 0.9, so what does that mean? The thread is sleeping a lot. Then the number of threads that you can have is less than or equal to 10 times the number of cores. So you can see how grim this really is, right? Why is it 10 times? 0 0.9 in the denominator, 1 minus 0 0.9 is 0 0.1. Bring that to the numerator, it's 10 times. So to answer your question, Mahasin, is that you are not just dependent on only on the memory. So fundamentally, it also depends on the number of cores, but also depends on whether your tasks are computation intensive or whether they are I.O. intensive. But also ask the question, do you really want to increase the memory or do you want something more efficient so you don't have to spend the money on increase the memory, right? This is like saying the implementation is poor, so you need more resources. I would rather have a better implementation than more resources due to poor implementation. So that's there to consider as well. I hope that answers your question. So, uh, so how did, uh, so question here is how did you arrive at 0 0.9? Oh, if, that's why the word is if, right? So if it is, and if it is not, if it is something different, you got to deal with something else. It got, that's the best case if you think about it. On the other hand, if you take this and say if it's I.O. intensive, and if your blocking factor is 0.5, then what's going to happen? Well, that's a 0.5 in the bottom, so that's pretty grim. It becomes a two times the number of cores, right? So that's the if. So it's a best case scenario is what I'm presenting here, but it's actually much worse than that in general. Uh, so how do you distinguish computation intensive, I guess, from I.O. intensive? Well, are you doing a math crunching? Or are you making a database call, logging stuff, talking to an external service? Is it I.O.? Or is it, you know, spinning through and performing calculations? That's the question. So computation intensive, intensive is where you're doing a lot of number crunching. Maybe you're doing a weather computing and you are trying to solve partial differential equations, right? So that could be really computation intensive, uh, Shyam. On the other hand, if I'm making a call into a remote server, accessing databases, writing to a log file, reading files, you know, those typically are pretty much I.O. intensive rather than being competition intensive. It is quite possible that your code is a combination of them as well. And in that case, you need to see what percentage it is sleeping uh, on I.O. versus it's actually doing the work as well. You probably have to determine that. Right, so with that said, let's talk about subroutines. So what is a subroutine? <laughs> Excuse me, a subroutine is really a function. So we typically do this in code. You call a function, it performs some work, and it returns a result. So subroutines often are just function calls you make, you get a response. 
Subroutines don't really remember the state of the previous call in general. You know, barring putting static, you know, local variables, this is something you don't normally keep around that much. So essentially in this case, what you're going to be doing generally is that you're going to be simply calling a function and getting a response from it. That's what you're going to do. Having said that, what is a coroutine? A coroutine remembers a conversational state and it can continue talking about it in the subsequent calls. It's kind of like you meet a colleague, let's say the previous day, and you are talking about something and you leave and the next day, you can almost continue your conversation from where you left, right? Because we remember that in our mind. And you can continue the conversation about the design you were talking about or a particular error that you were trying to really debug, and you can continue talking about it. So there's a conversational state that continues between the call. And, and a coroutine is one that remembers it. But how does it remember it? That's where continuations come in. So continuations are data structures that remember the state of a previous call and can continue from where you left off. Let's enter into the, entertain this thought with a little example, and I apologize for it because I'm going to show you a bit of a JavaScript. And so, but I think we should always learn from everywhere we can, including JavaScript. So I'm going to switch over here to a quick example in JavaScript, if you don't mind. So let's go over to a JavaScript example. Let's go ahead and create a little example sample.js and play with it. So here in the case of JavaScript, I'm going to start by saying, you know, let's start with a test to make sure my environment is working fine. And there is the test. What I want to do now is I want to say for, let's go ahead and say an element. And this is off, let's say from a function foo, I'm going to get it. And all I'm going to do is simply print out, let's say in the loop, let's say, and I'm going to say width, and I'm going to display the element that I got in this case. But the question is, what does foo actually return is the question. So I could say, for example, here, uh, a function foo, and maybe the function foo, I'm going to simply say output, let's say, entering, that's all I'm going to say right now. And I'm going to return, let's say, as an example, some values like so, right? So if I run the code, it says entering, and then it says one through all the way to five. Now, clearly, when you look at this example, you can agree that foo is a subroutine, isn't it? It's a subroutine because you enter it, do the work, and you get out. On the other hand, let's take this function foo, but I'm going to put a little star in that particular function. In JavaScript, that's a way for us to define what are called generators. So in this case, I'm going to say yield. And what am I going to yield? A value of one from that particular call in that particular function. But notice it says entering and then says in the loop with one. But then I'm going to go back to this code and say, let's say step one, and I'm going to say right now an yield, let's say, two. This time, it says step one in the loop with two. Let's try this a couple of more times. Let's go ahead and copy this over. And I say two right here. But I'm going to say yield three. And I'm going to do this one more time. But this time I say step three, and I'm going to yield four. So when I run the code, Notice how we are weaving in and out of that function. In a way, this is kind of a little weird, isn't it? We entered here to begin with. Then we exited over here. But then we entered right there. And we exited in there. Then we entered again in here. And then we exited over here. So in other words, if you think of this as a function, you didn't always enter the function in the top. The function has multiple entry points and multiple exit points. And you weaved in and out of that function in different times. The question is, how does it know what you have done so far and what it needs to do moving forward, right? So where is the previous state maintained? Exactly, that's the question. 
Now you know where that is maintained. That's called continuations, Sham. That's exactly what continuations are. So continuations are data structures, if you will. Um, so continuations are data structures. Uh, and the data structures that allow you to maintain that conversational state. So uh, behind the scenes, continuations will capture the current state of the call as you have it. And so when you come back, you can resume from there and move forward. And, and as Carl says, not just the stack itself, but all the lexical scope as well, right? The lexical scope is extremely important. Why? Just to answer the question, if you go back to this example again, and if you said over here constant, you know, something is equal to, let's say, 7. Now, way down here, I'm going to say console log step 4, but I'm going to yield, let's say, something. Now, this is coming after we came in and left quite a number of times, isn't it? So the, in the loop with 7, but that's a lexical scope that's there. So the lexical scope, in addition to the uh, stack, is maintained as well. So it's got to remember all the context of the call. So that becomes what's called your continuation. Now, continuation is a data structure that's behind the scene. So uh, to go back to your question, Sean, that's a really good question. In order to answer that, I'm going to take a slightly different example to illustrate this. I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but just to get a glimpse of it. So if I edit a sample, let's say, a sample.kt, this is Kotlin. And in the case of Kotlin, I'm going to say right here that I'm going to write a function. Let's say the function is going to be foo, and the function simply is going to return, let's say, an integer. So I'll say return an integer. And all I'm going to do within this function, let's say, is equal to return a value of 2, let's say. So nothing really exciting, right? So the function foo simply returns a result of 2. That's all I do. Now, I'm going to go to this code right here. We'll call it sample.kt. But what I'm going to do is to say Kotlin C dash JVM. And I'm going to compile that code into bytecode, Java bytecode. And when I compile it into bytecode, you can see the sample kt.class sitting there. Let's do a, a which Java P. And I'm going to use the Java P right there in this code. So I'm going to grab that one and simply say uh, Java P. And I'm going to ask for the sample.kt and look at the function. No surprise here, right? Notice the function foo is a final function returning an integer. It's a static function, so nothing. However, Going back to this function, I'm going to blow away the class file. And now I'm going to go back to the source code one more time. But I'm going to say suspend. So in Kotlin, you can say a function can be suspended. This is concept related to coroutines. But more so, you're saying that a function is suspendable. And in the other words, while in the middle of the function, your thread could go do other work and come back. So I just marked a suspend. That's all I did, nothing else. I go back here, and I compile the code one more time. And when I compile the code this time, I'm curious, what did I get? I go back and ask for the Java P one more time. But notice what just happened. For putting the word suspend, this goes back to your question, Sham, is the fact that I put suspend, the Kotlin compiler said, aha, I am going to pass a continuation as a parameter to the function foo so I can remember and capture the state internally that call was referring to, right? The stack and all the other information. So the compiler automatically does that behind the scene. So there's a quite a bit of syntax sugar happening here, right? So to illustrate this point, if I go back to the sample, if I go ahead and write a function, in this case, you know, f foo1, and a function, let's say, in this, in this case called a foo2, let's say, right? So here is a function, we'll call it foo1, foo and here's a function, let's say, foo2, and I'm going to go back to this code where one is a suspendable function, the other one is not, and I'm going to go ahead and 
ask for the compiler to compile the code. So let's go ahead and compile it. Oops, pardon me. Let's go ahead and compile the code again. And once I compile the code, let's run the Java P to examine the byte code right now. And you notice that the foo1 just returns an int, but the foo2 has a continuation baked in. So that is basically what continuations do, is they allow us to really capture that state and be very effective with it. So having said that, I'm going to show you something, and I hope we never have to do this. This is really for an internal purpose and maybe advanced libraries to use, but from the curiosity point of view, I want to know how this actually works. So much like the example you saw a minute ago in JavaScript, I'm going to go over here to the Java code right now. And in the Java code, let's get rid of all of that. And let's do something a little bit different. How about using continuations? So in order to use continuations, what I'm going to do here is continuations is part of Project Loom. And it's a first class citizen. It's actually available in java.lang. Just like thread is part of Java Lang, this is part of Java Lang. You can see how significant that is, the fact that it's actually part of Java Lang. Not even java.util.concurrent, right? It's that important, that uh, fundamental, if I want to say it that way. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say right here, uh, scope is equal to new continuation scope. And I'm going to just give it a sample as a scope, nothing really exciting. Then I say continuation uh, is equal to, so continuation, newation, uh, is equal to, and I'm going to say this is a new continuation where the continuation contains a scope, but it's going to take a function called do work as an argument. So I'm going to pass the scope to it. So the do work function is going to be passed in through a lambda to this continuation. So then what I do here is the do work function as you would expect. So public, let's say static, will create a void function called do work and it takes a continuation scope as an argument. Let's start with that basic step. So here I am with a really an empty function right now. Oh, so question from August. Uh, cool, how it's the standard library and not part of the language syntax? Well, it's a, it's a standard library because the syntax is not going to cut it. You really need an implementation to get the work done, right? So this is like a code you are calling, not just a syntax alone, to get some kind of a bytecode generation. There's significant work it needs to do behind the scenes for all the managing. So that's why it's not just a syntax to be done. Uh, it's, it's a lot more than just a syntax coloring, not just a bytecode generation. You need quite a bit of you know, work to be done behind the scenes for this to get the work done, isn't it? So as a result in this case, you have a function defined, but I'm going to say over here while not continuation dot is done. So I'm going to ask it, are you done? And it says, no, I'm not done. Well, then keep going. So I'm going to say over here, in the loop, just like in, in JavaScript, right? In the loop with, and I'm going to say thread right here, dot, let's say current thread, and I'm going to display the thread that's executing that piece of code and, and display it. So I displayed the thread. Then I'm going to say, continuation dot run and go on to the next step. Now, in this particular case, I'm not doing something, anything exciting right now. And it says in the loop with thread main five, that's what it returned as a response. But I go back to the do work function. And in the function, I'm going to say entering, and I'm going to output over here, thread, let's say, dot current thread, and I want to say what the thread really is that we are looking at right now. When I look at the output, notice it says entering thread main uh, with the th thread main, entering with the thread main. So it's the same main thread that's going back and forth in here. So we didn't create more threads after all. But then what I want to do here is to say scope. Well, continuation dot yield and then the scope. 
much like what we did in the case of JavaScript. And I yield, and in this case, I just said yield into it. Now notice it came back in here in the loop with thread. But then I go back here and say output, let's say step one, if you will, and I'm going to then provide the code like so, and I'm going to repeat this a few times, if you will. So here is my step two, and a step three, and a step four, if you will. And if you look at the output, you can see how we came in one, two, three, four, but in the loop, very similar to what we saw on the Java side, right? JavaScript side. So we are weaving in and out of this function as a core routine. So in general, though, what does this really mean to us in terms of how the code is actually working? And the answer to that question really is, imagine in your mind that you have a function, let's say, f1, and you also have a function, let's say, f2. The way that coroutines actually work is, imagine that this is like a timeline vertically. So from the top to the bottom is your timeline. You make the call, let's say to the function f1 right now. When you make the call to the function f1, the function f1 does some work, and now it goes ahead and makes a call in this particular case, let's say, and it's going to make the call to, in this case, function f2. And when it makes the call to function f2, function f2 does some work. And then what does it do? It returns back the call to the function, if you will, f1 at this point. So the request comes back to function f1, but you're not making a fresh call at this point. f1 does some work. And then right away, it makes another call internally to function f2 which then steps in the middle of function F2 and continues with the conversation, which can do some more work. And then you come back here. And at this time, what you're doing is you are saying, hey, I'm going to get back to the result in this case and do the work. And of course, at this point, the function may return. Obviously, here is the request that came in. And it's time for you to send the response back from this call. And so you may say, here is where I'm going to send the response back to the caller. And that may happen. So you can have a bounce back and put a ping pong, if you will, where they can collaborate. They are co-routines because they are cooperating routines. So they cooperate with one another. That's why they call co-routines. So what did we define? Uh, what would, where did we uh, define um, the definition of co-continuation. Uh, continuation is coming from the uh, uh, from the Java lang. That's where it's coming from. And of, of course, you know, you never have to import Java lang, right? So, so as a result, in this case, the continuation right here is coming from Java lang. Just as an example, if I go back here and say, oops, for me, if I go back here and say Java dot lang dot continuations, right? That's where it's coming from. That's, that's, a, that's a life uh, a location of where this, that is. And obviously, if I make a mistake right there, you can see a compilation error pop up that's not valid. So I'm going to put that back as lang, and you can see the compiler is happy. So it's part of the Java lang. Uh, that's what I was mentioning earlier, is that this is not part of a util library or anything. It's part of the lang itself. So, so that's basically why it's called a coroutine, because you go back and forth, they're cooperating with each other to fulfill the mission. Well, okay, so we kind of see what a coroutine is, but you, I hope we never have to use a continuation directly in our code, right? Uh, the day that you are using it directly in your code uh, is when you know you have probably gone the wrong way, or you're doing something super, super cool, right? Whichever it is. And uh, so that's basically something to keep in mind when it comes to, this is really a low level internal data structure, if you will. Uh, there's a person asking if there is no audio. Un unfortunately, I cannot uh, answer that question because they won't hear the audio. But if somebody can type in and say that you are able to hear and they may log out, refresh, whatever they need to do, uh, and, and maybe sacrifice something to get the audio back working. All right, so with that said, um, we want to talk about, uh, uh, in this particular case, how these things work. So this is where the concept of 
what they call as fibers or lightweight threads, super lightweight threads come in. Oh, so is, is a continuation serializable? Can you save and resume another day? I, I hope not. I hope not. So, uh, so uh, I don't think it's really meant for that. Uh, but again, you know, a lot of things in Java are uh, serializable. Maybe potentially that's something that can be serialized to send across uh, the wire, but, but definitely the intention is not persistence. So serialization is not persistence, right? So they're kind of uh, uh, different from each other. So, uh, so I, I could, it probably is serializable, but, but I don't think it's persistent. Uh, so where did we uh, use uh, is done? Uh, it's a function of uh, a continuation, right? So that's where we used. Again, don't worry about that so much. Continuation is something low level. I want you to understand it conceptually, not have to go into that more. Um, so having said that, uh, we want to really focus on the lightweight threads aspect of things. So what are virtual threads? Virtual threads are super lightweight threads. You say, oh my gosh, why super? Well, because the lightweight threads are taken already, right? So threads are lightweight. So if something is more lightweight, it's got to be super lightweight. So virtual threads are super lightweight. They are managed by the JVM and not by the operating system. So when a thread, virtual thread blocks, the task waits, but not the underlying thread. So let's step back for a minute. Imagine what we did before in the examples. When we had a task running on a thread, when the task was blocked, the thread was blocked. Now we are saying with a virtual thread, we are running a task on a virtual thread. The task is blocked. The virtual thread, underlying thread, can go do other things. And when the task is ready, you can assign a thread to get the work done. So benefit, you don't have resource blocked in and wasted, which means you need fewer physical threads, and you can have more virtual threads. You can have as many virtual threads as the number of tasks in your system with, you know, of course, there is always an upper limit, than having a physical thread. So let's take a look at this really again. Let's revisit the thread limitations and see how that actually changes right now. Well, remember I saved the code away, didn't I? So I'm going to bring back the code I saved. So let's go ahead and take this code we had, you know, saved away. I called it how many, if you remember. And I'm going to bring that back into the sample.java. And let's take a look at that code we wrote. And if you recollect, we were able to create only about, uh, well, it's just a different name for, they used to call it fibers. Now they call it virtual threads. So, so as this has been evolving over time, Mary, I like the name fibers actually, right? It's kind of cool. Uh, but, you know, the concept was loom and fibers. You kind of see the, you know, connotation there. Uh, but of course, threads also makes good sense for loom. So that's kind of where the loom came in. And I really like fibers, but really they are virtual threads. So the names kind of evolve over time. And in this case, we were able to create easily a 5,000 threads, if you remember. Oops, let me try this again. 5,000 threads, if you remember. So if you look at the output, we started 5,000 threads, not a problem. But if I come back to this code, what if I were to create, oh, let's say 7,000 threads, right? And you saw that I ran into a problem at 10,000 threads. I'm going to do 7,000. Seems to be 7,000 is OK. Maybe at 8,000 I can try. And you can see that it's trying to create 8,000 threads. Clearly, it met a problem in 10,000 threads, right? So I'll just put a 10,000 and see if that error still shows up. So when I run the code, it blows, blows up. So we know this, right? So 10,000 uh, threads, uh, you know, it seems to be a limit, right? Well, let's leave the thought aside. Let's go back to this code again. But this time, let's start with that little meager 100 threads again, a little small, humble beginning. So in this case, I'm going to go back to this code. I'm not going to start a thread anymore. But what am I going to do instead? I'm going to instead say that thread is equal to not a new thread, but thread dot 
start virtual thread. So I'm going to ask it to start a virtual thread rather than creating a new thread. When you say new thread, you're creating a lightweight thread. When you say new start virtual thread, you're creating a super lightweight thread, which is the virtual thread itself. So I'm going to go ahead and save that away and see what it does. It started 100 threads. But I want to go straight to the limits we saw earlier, right? That is 10,000 threads. So this is 10,000 virtual threads. And it's like, no problem. So it already seems to be better. But how many can I go? Let's try 100,000 threads. So let's go back here. It's like, bring it on. What about 500,000 threads, right? So if I try that again, it says you want 500,000 threads to create. Let's save that away and see what it says. It's 500,000 threads. Hey, what about a million threads, right? If your pulse rate is going up, that's quite natural, right? Because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm able to create a million threads right now. And, and it's like, why don't you give me something more challenging, right? So a million threads it was able to create. And how so? It's because it's like, I don't do much work. I'm not holding resources behind the scene. So this goes back to the earlier question that we had before, right? What if I have a lot of memory? Uh, Mahasin asked this question. I got a 50 gigs. What if I can go to 75 gigs? We can see that this is a better use of the resource rather than demanding it. So Rakesh says, what Java version this virtual thread is available on? I don't know, right? And the reason I say I don't know is this is pre-release. We don't know when it will be available. But you can download the project ver a Loom version. Don't use it for production, obviously, right? And you can, I can use that for that purpose. So is the scheduler fork join pool a virtual thread? No, not really. It's not a virtual thread, but you can create a virtual thread and it will run in a fork join pool. Uh, going back to your question, go in, that fork join pool does give you a bit of a relief, right? But if you do it properly and write code specifically, a fork join pool can do work stealing. But that's a special coding you have to do. So this is a far more than that. So internally, it's a fork join pool, but not all fork join pool are virtual threads. That's, that's not uh, the case. Uh, the question from uh, Deva is, how this will impact uh, Java monitors? Oh, well, you are going to notice what you're monitoring. But remember, if your monitoring is based on what the virtual machine is reporting, that's what you're going to see. But your monitoring is on what the operating system is say, seeing. You may see something very different, right? But that comes in later, right? You can't let monitoring spoil your performance, right? It should be the other way around. You want monitors to help you what you do better, not the other way around. Those things will evolve, right? It's too early in the game. We are, we are simply learning from these things and seeing how this is going to work. So there'll be impact on a lot of those things eventually. So we were able to create more threads in here. And I'm curious, really, right? What if I went to 2 million threads? I don't know, honestly, right? So I'm going to say 2 million threads and run it. And it's like, keep going, right? And you're kind of wondering, is this code actually even working? Because it just keeps going, right? And it's like an energized bunny, right? Keeps on going. And is there a limit to it? And I don't know, honestly, because I haven't really pushed it that much to see. Maybe out of curiosity, you can try and see. And of course, it's taking more time. Why? Because when the threads are completed, you still need the underlying thread to run it, but you can keep pushing it. Okay, I won't try this anymore. It's like I'm going to keep going in this case. All right. So with that said, what we want to do is to think about how we can benefit from this one. Again, I want to go back to the example we wrote previously, if you recollect. So I'm going to take the thread task example we wrote earlier. So let's go to the thread task example and take a look at the code we wrote. Remember what we did in this example. We cleared five threads, if you remember. And the five threads called the read response. And when it called the read, read response, what did we do? We printed what thread is making the request, and we printed what thread is processing the response when it comes back, right? So that's what we saw earlier. Let's go and take a look at 
the code and see what it provides in this case. So notice in the five second delay in here, you see that zero was processed by thread zero and zero was processed by thread zero. One by one and one by one and two by two and two by two and three by three and then post three by three as well. So you remember this very easy, right? The numbers match. The ID number and the thread number are the same coincidentally. That's great for our purpose. Now I'm going to go back to this code and the only change I'm going to make in here is simply to say I don't want to use a thread. I want to use a virtual thread. That's all the change I'm going to make. So I go back to this code in here and say rather than new thread like so, all I'm going to do is simply say over here, uh, thread dot start virtual thread. Before we run this code, let's understand the consequence of this. Because this is a virtual thread, when your task is stuck, the thread doesn't have to be stuck. The thread can go off and do other things. And when a task is completed asynchronously, you can give a thread for it and continue. Now, obviously, you're thinking, oh, my goodness, if that is the case, what happened to thread local? Well, I would say relying on thread local was a bad design idea from day number one, isn't it? Because that's an implementation detail. And remember what we've been learning over and over and over. You depend on implementation, you get hurt. So you want the flexibility to change your implementation after all. This is a great example of that scenario, in my opinion. So you go back to this code. You are going to get in here with a thread, obviously, that is going to report. But when you call this function, oh, wait a minute. But how does it know that it should not block and wait? Now you know why this is taking so long. This, I am very, very, very sympathetic to this because this is painstaking work. They had to go through every single library of function and ask the question, should this become non-blocking? And they've been working their way through to make it non-blocking where it should be. So this is painstaking work because for every single detail, they got to modify the code and make sure it still works properly. And that's one of the reasons why this is taking long is that they got to change every library function from blocking calls to non-blocking calls where it makes sense. Um, Haseem says, doing, uh, does using thread local slow down when app is computation intensive? Uh, TPS uh, on API in, in, is high? I don't know. Uh, I, uh, that's generally something I avoid using in the first place, uh, and I'm not a big fan of it. So uh, that's a completely orthogonal to the discussion here. So uh, I'll skip that. So essentially, in this case, what we are saying is, I don't want to block and wait on this. So make this call non-blocking so it can switch. In fact, the thread dot sleep, if you want to really think about it, is a sleep a blocking call or is sleep a non-blocking call, right, at a very fundamental level. We'll come back to that in a few minutes and, and look at it. So, in fact, why don't we look at it right now? I'm going to say received, and I'm going to say right here, let's say a sleep of 1,000 and put a little sleep in there and, and ask it to proceed after that. So, received, let's say received response, and then let's say after sleep, right? So, after, let's say sleep and print that information. So when I run this code, what do we notice? So in this case, ooh, where's the sleep coming from? A thread dot sleep, of course. So let's go ahead and try that again. When I run the code, what does it say? Oh, illegal state exception already started. Oh, of course, of course, of course, pardon me. I don't need to start this anymore. So thank you for that. So I'm going to say just the start virtual thread. I shouldn't be starting it again. Awesome. So when I go back and run the code, let's see what it says. So when you look at the output of this call, let's take a look at what happens after the call executes. So here is zero, just focus on that line. Zero was run by the pool worker one, as you can see here, but look at zero now. It was run by eight, as you can see here. And then of course here it said eight also. But if you look at one, that was run by worker two. 
If you look at one right here, that's a seven. If you look at one here, that's a 10. So that shows that this, even the sleep was not, not was non-blocking, isn't it? You are seeing the thread switching. This is like in a restaurant. You call a waiter and you say, I would like to, and you're thinking, and the waiter says, I'll be right back and runs away. And then you can say, hey, I would like some water, please. It's quite possible some other waiter drops and, and, and fills water and goes away, which is perfectly fine, right? All you care about is that you get water when you need it. It's not like you have an affinity, a waiter affinity, like thread affinity, where you say, no, you can't serve my table. It was that waiter, and, and that waiter should come and serve, right? Sure, anybody could be just serving water on, on tables, and that's exactly what you're seeing here, is a nice distribution across. So what is the consequence of something like this? The consequence is we are able to scale a lot better without that many resources. You can keep providing more tasks but you need fewer threads being blocked and waiting. So this is why it's called asynchronous because it is a non-blocking. Keep in mind, asynchronous always blocks on a call. It's a thread that doesn't block on the call. Asynchronous doesn't mean you run off without the results, right? That's fire and forget. Asynchronous is you don't block the thread for the response to arrive. The response always has to arrive if you need the response, but you're not blocking your thread. So anytime I use the word asynchronous, I always want to remind myself what I'm talking about is non-blocking call, right? That's what asynchronous really is. So you don't want to block your thread and wait on it. If you're creating other threads, that's parallel computing, not asynchrony at that point. That's not an excellent use of resources. So that brings us to asking the question, where does it make sense to use virtual threads? Let me just pause and see if you're able to answer that question. Where do you think I can use virtual thread? Where do you think it may not make much sense to use virtual threads? Uh, we talked about this a little bit along the way in answer to some of the questions. Let me see if you're able to answer. Maybe here's a good time to use it. Maybe here it is not, uh, and you can think about it, right? So, bingo, uh, Anbu uh, nailed it, right? So, uh, uh, Anbu says, in an IO-bound application, it makes sense. In a computation-intensive code, it doesn't make any sense, right? And, and Anbu is firing on all cylinders this morning in Chennai, as you can see, right? That's awesome, my hometown, so I'm always an affinity for that. So, essentially, that's basically what it is, is an I.O. intensive. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do this in a computation intensive, right? So essentially, that's where it really makes sense to use it. Um, uh, Vijay says, would reactive system libraries help, like non-blocking HTTP client or JDBC drivers? How do these systems compare to uh, Loom virtual threads? Beautiful question. Let's step back and talk about that a little bit uh, differently. If you look at a reactive application, don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of reactive API. I love it, I use it, I teach it, I have it for breakfast every day, I like it, right? But having said that, one of the things to really step back and ask the question is, when you write code in reactive applications, what are you really writing? Your code falls into a functional pipeline, right? And, and to me, this was an aha moment for me when I was learning reactive programming, so much that I tweeted one day and I said, reactive programming is functional programming plus plus. So when you start doing reactive programming, you are buying a ticket and saying, I promise to write functional style code. I promise to write a pipeline. And don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of functional programming, but I'm a fan of not being forced to do things. I always want to be given a choice, and I want to make the right decision based on what's right for my application. So if you tell me you will write functional code, I'll be the first person protesting on the road, right? Because I want to have a choice, and I want to decide when imperative is better for me and when functional is better for me. So to go back to your question, Vijay, is that the beauty of the project Loom is I can write asynchrony 
with imperative style. So if my code has exceptions, if my code has impure operations, Project Loom coroutines are amazing for it. If I want to write functional style code, a reactive API is amazing. And this is a big win for us because we get to choose what we want. If you want functional style and asynchrony, use reactive APIs. If you want imperative style and asynchrony, use uh, coroutines, right? So that's the beauty of you being able to make a choice based on what you want to do. And the next question or comment here is, uh, as Stan says, a web request response handling, absolutely, you can definitely do that, right? Because that's an IO operation and it makes really good sense to do that in your applications. So you nailed it, that's kind of where we can actually use this quite effectively and, and that's basically the power of this. Well, that's basically where we are heading with this uh, continuations and, and, and virtual threads. Very exciting times in my opinion. I, I think it's going to really fundamentally change. Is oh, question from Goldman. Is there a limit to nesting continuations? Okay. The answer is not really, right? Because you're going to make a call, and when the response comes back, you're going to make the next call from there, and they're all going to be non-blocking the threads, so there shouldn't be any limits at all in that regard, because just walking the call stack at the point with multiple threads, that shouldn't be an issue at all. And I think really, sincerely, I think that there's going to be a big deal in the future. And the reason is, this is going to fundamentally shift two things for us. The first is, we're going to enjoy better, a far better resource utilization. So we're not going to be forced to go bigger and bigger in hardware. We can be sensible in scaling with the better optimal solutions. Second, it also is going to fundamentally change the way we write. Don't get me wrong again, I'm a fan of parallel programming. My dissertation was in parallel computing, by the way. I have a soft corner for it. I love multi-threading and parallelism and concurrency. But in the world we live in today of microservices and serverless computing and making calls across the web, I think asynchrony is a lot more important than parallel, even though parallel is still important in several places. And I know it's really hard to admit, but I think JavaScript got it right in the beginning where they doesn't put their money onto asynchrony rather than parallelism. I think this is the right direction for Java. It's the right direction for developers. And I'm really, really thrilled at where this is going. I want to uh, thank you for all the beautiful questions, all the good interactions. You kept me on my toes. I love it. And I want to thank you for taking the time to join. I want to thank uh, Mary for all the hard work and the Chicago Java Zoo for having me. I really appreciate it. That's all I have here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, one other question from Vijay. If we can make a lot of virtual threads with Loom, is, uh, pool, uh, is, is pooling threads and hence execute our new fixed thread pool a thing of the past? Well, I wouldn't say it's a thing of the past, but I think it really makes sense in the context of multi-threading. And remember, if you're doing competition intensive, you still need to really rely upon that in several regards, isn't it? So, so I wouldn't say that it's a thing of the past, but I think it really makes sense in certain contexts versus another, I would say. That's kind of where you want to really look at it. Any other questions or uh, thoughts? Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Does it make sense to replace Tomcat's HTTP request thread pool with virtual thread? I certainly think it does. And, and, and honestly, I think uh, that's what the, is the next wave we're going to see. Is once this is released, we are going to see a, a time when application servers and web servers all going through a shift. And they all need to start upgrading for a Project Loom. So we are looking at several years of transformation ahead, Naveen. So this is not going to be a short-term thing. The impact is going to be quite significant. In fact, I would say the impact of this is going to be far more than the impact of lambdas, if you will. So this is going to be huge in terms of the change we're going to see. Uh, Jeff says fixed thread pools might uh, make sense when uh, taking uh, talking to uh, things to like databases. Uh, the underlying threads, I would completely agree, but that doesn't mean you need to block yourselves in 
even here you can control, right, how many threats you want to have. It's not that you want it to be uncontrolled. That's not the goal, really. But the goal is not to be blocking when you decide on the number of threads, right? That's kind of the distinction here. Um, and Rocky says, not to sidetrack, but I have to ask this. How do you switch between VI editing and running commands? Well, actually, it's a quite amount of uh, scripts behind the scene and also running um, uh, some uh, you know, commands to automate stuff. So purely mostly command line automations, that's basically what it is. Uh, how do you get those random images in your background? Uh, really cool, well, thank you. Uh, those are mostly uh, pictures I've taken when I do hiking. Uh, I'm a big nature lover, so every week I kind of go out and take pictures and I just load them up, that's all. And the terminal is background is, uh, is, is uh, uh, transparent. So you're just looking at terminal window, that's what you're looking at here, is this is purely a terminal window, that's what it is. Nothing really going on other than that. Um, so I have done a, a lot of Golang and looks less similar to Go routines. The concept, you know, if you really think about Go routines uh, and uh, look at the history of computing, way back in time, languages like CLU have had Go routines. So Go routines are not new. They've been in computer science for a long time. You know, if you ask me, how do I feel? I've been programming for about 35 years now. And if you ask me what's my experience, I'll be very honest to you about it. I feel like I am living my youth one more time, where everything I used to read in a book, I'm actually seeing in uh, languages that are mainstream. You know, back in time, those things were available only in esoteric languages. But now, I can use them in a mainstream language. So it's almost like reliving my youth, where I used to read about stuff, but now I can actually use it. You know how cool that is, right? And you would say, wouldn't it have been cool if you had been able to use when you read it? Yeah, sure. But but at least now, right? This is like being a second, giving it, given a second chance where you can actually use stuff you have once read about. So that's the way I feel about it. Any idea which version of JDK is going to adapt it? I have no clue about it, uh, Thrumlesh. I, I uh, you know, I, I'm not involved in uh, any of those uh, inner details. Uh, I would say when it is ready, right? And and it's it's closer than uh, ever before. Uh, there was a couple of uh, you know uh, um, conferences ago. Uh, Mark Reinhold was asked the question, uh, "Hey, uh, what is the uh, timeline when it'll be re released?" And the answer was, "It'll be released when it's ready." And uh, and and honestly, right? Uh, that's a really useful answer in my opinion because you, this is not as you know easy thing. You want to make sure it's really, really done fairly well. And I'm going to plug in uh, Vincent right there. Uh, just look at the note. Uh, he's giving Nintendo Switch. So uh, go, Vincent. Go, absolutely. So may, do play. Please click on that link and uh, get access to that. Um, uh, oh, it's running through the screen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amok. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, 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 you, you are uh, asynchronous, Mary, so welcome back. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Hi, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so another question here is, um, uh, with the imperative programming style, how easy it is to convert existing code to take advantage of virtual threads? That's a beautiful question, Carl. Uh, where it makes sense, of course, should we ever need to use yield and continuations? Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, in fact, that's one of the best selling points of this, I think. Uh, this is gonna play really well. If, if you take, oh, you know what? Let me ask you this question, right? Uh, the, to answer your question, I'll throw back another question at you, if you will. So, so uh, where am I? Uh, let me go to the directory. Oh, right here. Did you notice this code that you saw here was an imperative style code, isn't it, right? That's not a functional style code. Uh, call, that's an imperative style code. And what did I do? I simply went up here and I said, hey, rather than writing the new and passing that into the thread, where that was running in the traditional thread, as you can see, right? So zero running in zero, as you can see here, and when the response comes back, zero running in zero, and zero running in zero, I simply said, hey, I don't want to use the thread, I want to use a virtual thread, and, 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 and off we go. Of course, I'm simplifying this way too much, though, to, to be fair, because to go back to your question call, it's very easy, but the big uh, if there is, 
the functions you are calling are going to relinquish the thread. So if I call a function here that's not going to link, relinquish the thread, then it doesn't matter. It's not a question of easy or hard, right? So that's kind of where the difference is going to come in. We need to really keep that in mind. So that it's not the effort, but it's a consequence that we need to be careful about, uh, something to think about uh, for, for going back to Carl's question. Um, so uh, Naveen says, as um, uh, said, virtual threads are suitable for network I.O. calls and not for CPU intensive. I suppose mixing CPU intensive and ASIC plus processing into virtual threads might limit the concurrency. Uh, not as much the concurrency, but the, but the performance, right? So uh, you still have to worry about race conditions, stuff like that, if you're not doing it properly. But, but performance, you're not going to get the best throughput out of that. So that is actually true. And um, uh, of course, um, I, think, uh, I think we covered most of the questions here. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Mary. Again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you again, everybody. Yes, so much, Venkat. Yeah, I just actually told anyone, too, if they want to turn on their uh, video and ask you questions directly, they are welcome to unmute themselves. I don't know how much time you still have, Venkat, if you want to stay a little bit and answer, if, if, if anybody has any more questions. Yeah. My, my class starts at uh, 5 a.m. my time, so oh, I've got a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, you're tired too, yeah. Okay, well, then maybe we, we shouldn't hold you. Yeah, that's true. You you need to take a rest too. You, you've you been talking the whole day. Wow, 5 a.m. No, this is right. like 7.30 for you or 7, you know, in, in your time zone, right, mountain time. Okay, yeah. well, then in that case, we, we shouldn't be holding you um, any longer. You need to yeah, eat something too and relax with families and everything. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> In that case, then, yeah, thank you so much, Venkat. But we do have our raffle. Uh, but Venkat, please don't feel like you need to stay. Um, I you. don't want to hold you up. But again, we want to thank you so much again, Venkat, for um, you know having done this, uh, you know, really like wonderful, amazing presentation. Yeah. I'm learning, even though I got interrupted and all that. But I will watch that uh, the recording, and then we'll have the recording available too, and we'll post it on the meetup page. Thank you. Um, and so now, yeah, with this, uh, thank you very much, Vancat, and thank you everyone for uh, ha having joined us today. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I'm sure you enjoy it.